Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Happy Easter. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And some of you looked lost when you came in here. You're like, somebody's in my spot. <laughs> I've got to sit up front now. <laughs> well, you dressed up nice for it, so that's, that, was, that was good. Uh, you ever forget where you put something? As we get older, or as I get older anyway, I sometimes forget things. I forget where I put stuff. Now, kids make fun of us when we do this. They think it's funny. I used to do this, so if there's a thing such as karma, this is what happens to me. <laughs> I lose things. I used to laugh at my mom. She used to lose her glasses all the time. She'd put them on top of her head and then look around the house for them. Where did I put my glasses? And was, as we get older, we talk to ourselves too, right? So I used to think it was really funny when I was a little kid to watch my mom. Where did I put my glasses? And when I was really little, I couldn't help myself. Mom, you're still either on top of your head, you know? But as I got older, I learned to restrain myself a little bit entertain myself, watching her try to find the glasses all over the place. Now, on Easter, we intentionally lose things. When I was a kid, we used to have the Easter egg hunt. They'd get the plastic Easter eggs, and they'd put the candy inside there and hide them all over the house. And every year, it seems as if my parents had the same conversation about the eggs. Did we get them all? Are we missing any? Every year, and every year, it seemed as if, maybe a couple days later, a week later, you find one. And then sometimes, many years later, we found them into adulthood. Has that ever happened to you? No? Here's the real question, if it has. Did you eat the candy? Did you eat the old candy? How long does it take before jelly beans expire? 
Nobody seems to know. Now you're all going to check. You're going to look at the jelly bean bags when you get home. Do these ever expire? There were a lot of things about childhood that were funny growing up. But I'll tell you what was not funny was when we got lost. That wasn't funny. You see, my mom would take me out and about to a lot of different places. At least it's a normal ringtone. <laughs> and I didn't mind some places. Like, the grocery store was fun. Because if you were really good, you got candy, right? At the checkout, they have all the different kinds of candy. So that was cool. The mall, not cool. Because we wouldn't spend a whole lot of time in the stores I liked. Like, Toys R Us. Nope. Candy store. Nope. My mom always shopped for clothes, or it seemed that way. And that was boring. Except the dress barn. I liked the dress barn. It was kind of cool. Lots of places to play and hide. I especially liked the rounders, the clothing rounders. I would go under there and pretend I was in a tent or a spaceship or something. I'd get creative. And one time, I found myself in the spaceship for way longer than normal. I started thinking, my mom can't be actually buying anything. She just browses all the time. What's taking so long? So I left the spaceship. I came out, and I did what we do as kids when we get lost. Mom? Mom? And it turns into, Mommy? Mommy! Start panicking. Sorry, sound guy. <laughs> John's awesome. The store employee comes over, and this is really funny, because they say the same thing every time. Don't worry, we'll find your mom. Mom's not the one who's lost. <laughs> she probably doesn't need to be found. I am lost, so I'm panicking, right? I don't know what my mom was thinking. Maybe she thought I was following her out. Maybe she's trying to get rid of me. I don't know. <laughs> Highly plausible. <laughs> to this day, we'll never know. So she went to the places she thought I would be. Toys R Us, the candy store, I wasn't there. So she decided, I'll retrace my steps. Comes back to the dress barn, and she sees me in the distance. And what does she do? She runs up to me, gives me a big hug, a kiss, and then, what's wrong with you? Never do that to me again. You almost gave me a heart attack. <laughs> a flip of the switch. This is the reaction. When the child that was once lost is found. Southwest Florida, some of you may be visiting. And you may not be aware that in Southwest Florida, we lose old people all the time. It's called a silver alert. Maybe you saw it on 75. You're driving and then you see the signs. Ah, oh, we lost one. You know, gray hair, you know, blue Honda Civic or whatever it is. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. <laughs> what if we lost a famous person? Now, I bet you can all think of famous people you hope will get lost, right? No names. But what if I told you that we actually lost one of the most famous people in history? Joe Biden. Nope. He's not one of the most famous people in history. He had a little delay on that one. I'm on the next joke. <laughs> we lost... Alexander the Great. They don't know where the tomb of Alexander is to this day. They're still looking for him. Think about it for a second. It's one of the greatest leaders in all of history. It's why the Bible is written in Greek. He conquered so much of the world. He's so famous, yet they lost him. Did they forget to write it down? How could they lose someone like that? How can you not know where you buried someone so famous? But in contrast, in Jesus' case, they knew exactly where they put him. Jesus 
was crucified. He died. They thought they lost him to this life. But there was no doubt about where they put him. After he dies, a guy named Joseph of Arimathea asks Pilate for Jesus' body. He was a member of the Jewish council, but he didn't agree with them. He's kind of curious. So he asks Pilate for the body. Pilate grants his request. He, with the help of Nicodemus, they prepare Jesus' body for burial. 75 pounds or so of spices, a long linen sheet. They wrap him up. They put him in a tomb carved out of rock. He rolls the stone in front of him. The Jewish leaders, later, they go to Pilate and they say, while Jesus was alive, he was saying he was going to rise from the dead. We don't want his disciples to steal the body and claim that he rose from the dead. So take precautions. So Pilate orders that the tomb is sealed. And that guards are placed there to guard it so it can't happen. Sunday's coming. Sunday comes. An angel comes down from heaven. There's an earthquake. The stone rolls away. The guards pass out. They faint. Now, women were watching when Jesus was buried. And so now they decide, after observing the Sabbath, to come on Sunday morning and anoint Jesus' body. And they're talking to each other about it, and they're saying, oh, how are we going to roll the stone away? Kind of heavy. They get there, and they didn't need to. It's been rolled away. They enter the tomb. They thought they lost Jesus. Someone must have stolen him. No. Angels appear, and they let him know. Why are you searching here? among the dead for the living. Jesus is risen. He told you about that. Go tell the other disciples. And so they do. And then Jesus appears to them, the disciples and others. That's what we celebrate today. They thought he was lost. But now he's found. And they remembered to write it down. You see, it's not just the people that were witnesses, remarkable, that women were witnesses. They were the first to witness. Crazy, especially that time in history. Women weren't allowed to be witnesses in a court of law. The gospel flips everything upside down, doesn't it? Pretty amazing. They're witnesses. But he made sure to write it down. Kind of important. So many scholars, historians, will call the gospel accounts and the books of the New Testament portion of the Bible witnesses, because that's what they are. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, witnesses. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, he's an apostle. He's a witness to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Mark, probably a little kid at the time, still a witness. Luke interviewed many witnesses, checked out all the facts, He's also a part of the history of the early church. He appears in Acts. John, the disciple Jesus loved, is an apostle, a witness to the events. And then we have other witnesses, 27 books of the New Testament. They're witnesses to Jesus, to the early church. They're important. And they're all written in a witness period, remarkable for writings of that time. Yet some still doubt. However, nobody seems to doubt Alexander, do they? You just take it at face value. Of course, he did this, that, and the other thing. Everything you've learned about him, you just say, yeah, nobody doubts it, right? Universities, colleges, kids are pretty confident in Alexander the Great. But so many of them doubt Jesus, especially what we celebrate today. But here's the difference between the writings about Jesus and the writings about Alexander the Great. When we compare them, we see that the best works we have, there's one, Life of Alexander by Plutarch. It was written around the same time-ish as the Gospels, around 100 AD or so. But here's the problem. Alexander the Great died in 323 BC. 
June or July, we're not sure. That's about 400 years before life of Alexander. Now, there's some other writings, but they're not so good. They come around 300 years after Alexander dies. Not in a witness period. That's all we have now. That's all we can read. Yet nobody doubts it. Interesting. You contrast that with the writings about Jesus, way better evidence for everything Jesus did than for Alexander. Amazing. Yeah, people doubt. And in the early church, they did too. This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is written. They're doubting the resurrection. Now, 1 Corinthians is special. And I know even if you've never picked up a Bible and read it, you've heard 1 Corinthians 15 at a wedding. Beautiful poetry. It's great. But Paul, an apostle, has a different reason for writing than your wedding. 1 Corinthians 15 is very important. It's a defense of the resurrection when it's in doubt. It comes about 25 years after Jesus is crucified. And for this time in history, that's remarkably close to the events. They normally wait a long time. This is very, very close. The resurrection is extremely important. It can be argued that Easter is the most important holiday or thing that we celebrate. In the early church, every Sunday was the Lord's Day. They remembered it and celebrated it. It was very, very, very important. This is how important it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 12, Paul writes, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. The resurrection is central and essential to our faith. Paul begins this section by detailing the gospel. And pay close attention to what he says. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I, Paul, is saying, I also saw him. Notice all the witnesses. We don't have anything like that for Alexander the Great. It's a lot of witnesses. Some of them are still alive. Paul's kind of suggesting, go ask them. Go ask James, go ask Peter, any of the other apostles. 500 or so witnesses. Me. It's impressive. They're witnesses to something that was previously kept hidden, kept a secret until the right time for a specific purpose. Paul writes to the Colossians, he says this, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too, not just Jewish people, all of you. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing 
his glory. This is often missed in Easter messages. Do you know that through what we celebrate today, Christ's resurrection, Jesus gives us assurance of sharing in his glory. Beautiful. When we die, we seem lost. When someone we love dies, what do we say? We say we lost them. I'm sorry for your loss. But through Christ, we will be found. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. When the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. We may be lost for a time, but through Christ we are found. When we look at Luke's gospel account, we get to chapter 15 also. And there are three parables Jesus tells. And unfortunately, they often get disconnected and taken out of context. You've heard me preach about this. People who are regulars here are now going, oh, here he goes again on the context thing. Not the verse of the day. No. They're often removed from one another, but they're supposed to be taught as a set. Why? Well, that's the way Jesus does it. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea, right? But no, we know better than him. So we just take little pieces of it. But they're a set. And it's interesting. The backdrop is this. Jesus is hanging out with people like you and me, a bunch of sinners. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, these are the religious leaders of the time. If you're new, they're all holier than thou. So they're saying, he hangs out with all the sinners and tax collectors and things. So Jesus does what he does. And he starts teaching in parables that are going to be pointed at them. He teaches about a shepherd who has 100 sheep. One of them goes astray. The shepherd leaves the 99 in the wilderness just to look for that one sheep. When he finds the one sheep, he puts it on his shoulders and he heads back home. When he gets home, he celebrates with his friends. It's a joyous occasion. And so it is in heaven. There's much more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents, turns to God than for 99 righteous people who've never gone astray. Then there's a story of a woman with 10 coins, drachma. She loses one of them. She lights a lamp and scours the whole house just to find that one coin. And when she finds it, she celebrates with her friends. Look, I found my coin. And so it is in heaven. The angels celebrate when one sinner repents and turns to God. Then there's the one you all know. There's a father with two sons. The younger son demands his inheritance before his father dies. His father gives it to him. A short time later, he goes out to a foreign land and he squanders the inheritance, wastes it all, spends it on wild living, it immediately says. He becomes destitute, starving. Now, there's a famine in the land. So he convinces a farmer to give him a job. The farmer sends him out in the field to watch after and feed the pigs. Now, if you're a Jewish listener at that time, pigs are unclean, not just dirty. You can't eat them. So he's destitute. He's at the very bottom. That's it. He starts to get hungry. He wants to eat the pig food, the carob pods. But they won't even give that to him. So he gets to thinking. My dad's servants aren't starving. Maybe I'll just go back to him. And you know what? I'll say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. 
I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me be your servant. So he does just that. And we get a beautiful picture of the father seeming to wait for the son as he comes back. And as he sees the son in the distance, he runs to him. He wraps his arms around him, kisses him. But the son says, no, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me be your slave. Father says, "Mm -mm." he orders one of his servants to get the finest robe, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. For my son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. There is no place we can go. Nothing we can do which is too far out of God's reach or his loving arms. When writing about our present suffering, being nothing, compared to this future glory that we're talking about this morning in Christ. Paul writes this, Romans 8.38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what the Word of God says. But remember this. The world is going to tell you something different. We can't let the demons feed our doubt. There will be accusers. There will be people trying to drive a wedge between us and God, from the glory we share in our inheritance through Christ Jesus. The world says, you're not worthy. But the word says, you're worth it. There's a person in the story we can't forget about. And people often do. You see, the father throws a huge celebration kills the fattened calf and has a feast for his son. They're celebrating. There's the older brother, though. He's out working and he's returning home from work and he can hear all the celebration. What's up? What are they doing? One of the servants says, oh, your younger brother came back. Dad threw a party for him. The older brother gets mad. What? I can't believe this. Well, Father realizes it, comes out to see his older son and says, come on in, join the party. No, you've never done anything like this for me. You haven't even sacrificed a goat for me and my friends. But I've been here with you. Yet, my younger brother, he squandered his inheritance. On prostitutes, he adds, another accusation. (laughs) Father says, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead. And now he's come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. You are never too far away, nor has God gone too far away for you to return. Maybe you've been lost, but now you've been found. No matter what you've done, God is waiting for you with open arms to bestow his grace, mercy, and love on you. And through what we celebrate today, we too can share in the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our bodies may die, but through Jesus, we too will have eternal life in Christ. Let me pray for you. 
Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for bringing those seeking you here. I pray that they develop a deeper relationship with you, Lord, to make that deeper commitment to come back to you, knowing that you're waiting with arms wide open, that you love all of us and you don't want to see any of us get lost or go astray. Be with every one of these souls as they go out this week. Lord, I thank you again for this body. Fill us with your spirit as we just make a new commitment to you this morning. Anyone hearing this in the sound of my voice, just let them believe, believe in Jesus in their minds and their hearts. Accept him as Lord and Savior. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.